Before we go into this event, like I've been, um, I wanted to just take a moment for us to acknowledge that this work, whether it's organizing events or like making films or, or music, is only possible because of the the long lineage of activists and artists and organizers and healers who came before us. And I also wanted to acknowledge that though we have the pr privilege to imagine sanctuary together at <laughs> NYU, right now as we speak at the US-Mexico border and other borders all over the world, there are thousands of families strugg struggling to get and retain sanctuary and millions of communities who are defending their, their homelands and shores from climate change gentrification and colonization, as well as folks who haven't yet been offered the space to imagine to, to imagine a physical or spiritual sanctuary for themselves, because we all know about how oppression not just affects our physical bodies, but our mental health, and also our capacity to, to imagine. So I just want us to take a moment to send our love to all of those people and communities and the animals and plants, both here and far away. And then, and so we can take a breath t together. And then, and I want to invite everybody to ground ourselves in, in this space and just feel the beating hearts of everyone in, in this room. And thank you for making the choice to be here together and to listen to each other's stories. Um, so the first person I wanted to bring up is um, Laura Portman, who is a soloist and and um, vibrant collaborator, who is White, Mount, White Mountain Apache and works across recorded albums, live performances, and film and artistic soundtracks. She has performed at the Whitney Museum of American Art and the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and the and the Center Pompidou in Paris, among countless other established DIY venues all over the U.S., Canada, and, and yet and Europe. In 2008, Ortman founded the Coast Orchestra, an all Native American orchestral ensemble that performed a live soundtrack to Edward Curtis's film In, in the Land of the Headhunters, uh, the first silent feature film to star an all American cast. Ortman lives in Brooklyn, New York. Thank you so much.
but not least, Genesis Mankaren Abak is a Kachikil filmmaker and writer from Queens, New York, and Boca, Guatemala. She is co-founder, producer, and writer for Tierra Narrative, a multimedia storytelling platform and production house dedicated to the creation of new narratives through transnational cultural production between the Central American diaspora and the homeland. She is an alum of NYU and Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism, where she studied creative writing and documentary film, <coughs> respectively. Genesis is one of the three organizers and curators for the inaugural AICH Indigenous Creatives Fiesta Festival. She is currently working on her first short film called Dollar. In what ways do you feel that your films and music um, that you share addresses issues of sanctuary, however you define that? Um, it could be like sanctuary for the earth, for yourself, and you know, for your people. I am a member of the Sheer Zalbanayin Sheer Majapie. I belong to the Ogwa Lakota and Dene peoples. Uh, thank you, first and foremost, for being here. It's an honor to be with, uh, invited, and to be sitting with all of you guys. So thank you for having us, Jess and Tommy. Um, Sanctuary for me, uh, relating to the whole big picture of everything, um, I really felt like both my characters are going through some sort of seeking of internal sanctuary. Uh, for me, um, I try to portray uh, empowered indigenous women on screen because I feel like there's a lack of representation out there. And in both my in both my films, I feel like there's a common theme of internalized, like finding your own safe place inside you so that you can battle what's out there. And I think for me, you know, um, bringing out that strength, bringing out that sort of resilience um, is something that a lot of us can relate to because we all have trouble finding that. And in both my films, my character's journeys were all that happened in a very small amount of time. It, it's, it's kind of overcoming that barrier and breaking that threshold um, of finding your own safe space and what that feels like. Um, yeah, thank you all again, Mr. Wilson. Very honored to be here. Um, yeah, I mean, m the first two films that played were mine. Um, they're both pretty different, <coughs> I think. Uh, but for Minobi Matsuin, it's for me, it's like um, thinking about community and thinking about how we look out for each other and how we look out for our relations and creating the, a sanctuary or safe space for each other and creating space and taking back space because like the, the lead uh, gym in that film is, is primarily in like a city space and, he's in a, in a, and the coffee shop that he works at is this really like gentrified area of Grand Rapids and it's a very, uh, very white space and so Bungish and Ogrequay kind of inserts herself into that space and and just speaks to him in the language. And that to me is so important. And the same it's the same reasons why Rizal and myself and others at many other at many talks and speeches will introduce themselves in their native tongue. Um, it's it's being in these spaces and and inserting ourselves and taking up space with our languages and with um, traditional ways. And that's that's to me what Minobu is. It's it's that. And, um, yeah, and, and Nikki, I'm not sure. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's her in returning to, um, I mean, it's her becoming a superhero that's based on Anishinaabe stories of the Thunderbird. And it's just um, finding strength within yourself and finding strength within, like she, you know, she, she realizes that her power is, is within her, but it's also within, within our stories and within our our creation stories and, and, and spirits. Uh which uh you need Hennessy's Manchine Wah. Uh you need Maya Hitchikin uh and New Yorker. Uh so my name is Genesis, I am Maya Hitchikin um from New York and I'm producer of the short film, the last short film Isabel. 
Um, and I think for me, when um, as a producer, maybe a set isn't a sanctuary, but it should be a safe place. A safe place, um, especially for us who are working with. Youth. Um, I think that throughout the process of filming this event, I learned a lot about how much work it takes to actually make a place safe. Um, not just like physically, but also like mentally and uh, food-wise, water-wise. Um, I think it was very much a learning um, experience, uh, being my first time as a producer for a short film, a uh, narrative short film. So I think that my takeaway was that it's easy to say that a place is safe, but it's so much more difficult and much more work um, to making it a place actually safe for everyone involved. Hey everyone, um, I'm Kenya. Thank you so much for inviting us into this space. Um, yeah, um, the process of Isabel, I mean, I think filmmaking often didn't feel like a sanctuary. It felt very, like, um, violent, to be honest. Sometimes it feels very, very capital, um, capitalistic and so on, and it's too fast. And so it's very violent on the body and on the emotional as well. There's no time to process when you have, like, a certain amount of time to film while you have equipment, <laughs> rentals to return, and if you don't film, like, you're fucked. So <laughs> in, in that sort of sense, um, the production was very painful um, for me specifically, but I very much found sanctuary um, when we had our conversations, you know, about the story. When we um, were working with Susana, which is the actress in the film, and, you know, the memories that I had written were her memories as well. So that sort of became a sanctuary where we we had these um, conversations about her own migration, right? And she had a period of like finding her own sanctuary and her own hometown back here too, as well as in El Salvador. So it was those interpersonal connections between sort of like finding the story that were really the sanctuary. But everything else, they still, I think we have a lot of conversations about how do we make film that doesn't feel like a hierarchy, like that doesn't feel like we're making work to, I don't know, like there's there's a very sort of violent part to filmmaking that we're trying to break down as we go. You make more tender also. Yeah. Yes. I like to, you know, um, think about, it's, it's uh, maybe more like an energy of, of how I gather my information to play for which is. And uh, try and speak to the atmosphere uh, of the emotional comfort and experimentalism. Keep it very present at the same time, also. No, um, thank you. And um, yeah, I mean, one of the reasons why we wanted to have this event with y'all is because. Um, you know, we're thinking about like sanctuary in like all different kinds of ways, and I feel like that really shows up in your films and in your music, and sort of to redefine how it is that we think about like sanctuary and how we it, how we think even about migration. Um, I come from a migrant rights background. Um, you know, we're both sort of interested in like my, migrant rights, climate, sort of those intersections. But I think I mentioned in the in um, earlier that um, you know there are ways in which like indigenous knowledge and indigenous understandings of migration are sometimes er erased, right? And, um, you know, even when we think about, like, the El Salvadorian, like, young person in your, um, in your, you know, film, when we think about, like, currently what's happening, like, a lot of the folks who are migrating are indigenous folks, right? Um, and so my question to all of y'all, but perhaps maybe the two of you could start, um, is how do you approach migration and sanctuary from an indigenous lens? Um, I think for me, because I am Kachikid, which is our homelands are not here. Our homelands are in another nation state that is currently called Um I think it really starts with like conversation and like talking to like your friends who may be more involved in the migrant movement, but also just bringing awareness to like, hey y'all, like maybe just change the language a bit or just let's have a conversation about how migration is so different for indigenous folks compared to people who are mestizo or perhaps are not um, are not see, are not don't carry that knowledge or you know just come from for this reason so I don't know I think it's a difficult conversation to have because if we do just say oh yeah indigenous people like migrate that's also very like 
overarching umbrella. Like there's so many different stories and like class is also a, a huge like component of like why people travel or not travel to me, migrate. Um, so it's I think conversation is important. Um, I think obviously highlighting narrative stories, um, native narrative stories are important. Um, but it's yeah, it's it's something that I've been struggling with, especially within like the larger like Latino or Latina like news mainstream media. They b rarely talk about that. Um, that aspect of migration, I think it's a really huge issue. Yeah. Anishinaabe people with uh, migratory and from the Great, the Anishinaabe people, for those don't, that don't know, are from the Great Lakes area. And uh, the territory was basically cut in half by the Canadian US border. <coughs> and so there's a lot of familial relations that were cut off and like they just don't exist anymore. And it's still within our communities, it's still a lot of scenes like, are you a Canadian Anishinaabe or an American Anishinaabe? And it's just kind of frustrating to deal with. But in, because in Anishinaabe people, we traveled with the seasons, and so that was also cut off. And like now, whenever I cross the border, I have, like, I'm legally able to cross the border without the US Canadian border with my tribal. ID card and a birth certificate. But if you do that, like anybody, any Anishinaabe person will tell you, um, the ones that don't tell you they should do it will say it's not worth it because you're guaranteed to get stopped and you'll get held for hours without, you know, it's such a pain. But uh, luckily, I've been around people who have, who have been changing my thought process and are, you know, it's just like, no, we have to. We have to uh, assert ourselves, and we have to assert our sovereignty. And like, it will take a long time, but we have to think about the future. And like, if we don't do it now, like, you know, the ones in the future are the ones who suffer. So, um, thinking about it in that way, and I think, um, yeah, it's just, it's it's, it's very, uh, I don't know, it's just it's so frustrating. Mm -hmm. Well. Um I'll speak from my Oglala side. Uh, we were nomadic people. Um, we followed our food source, the buffalo. Uh, and uh, that was survival. And sometimes when I think of myself here in these contemporary times, I think, what am I doing here to survive? And I say survive because I'll be honest, I'm not exactly like living the life. I, w I work hard. I work hard to, to earn what I have and to be here. And so sometimes I, I, I do think of it as surviving. And because of that, I think of uh, my ancestors, um, what they went through, the hardships they went through. Uh, you know, and this goes back to the massacre of Wounded Knee in 1890 and, and to the long walk of my Dene side. And, you know, we've had to survive and we've had to, like, leave places or leave places that where we were born, where our people came from. And for my Dene side, it's the Four Sacred Mountains. And my Oglala side, it's Wind Cave in the Black Hills. And being removed and displaced. Uh, sometimes, you know, I often feel displaced as well in the big scheme of things. And that brings a lot of sadness. But then I also am reminded of, you know, why I exist today and why my ancestors fought so hard for us to, to be here. And, you know, and then that, that, brings, that brings me back, that, bring, that grounds me again. And that when wherever I'm at, I can always find um, a reminder of, of some sort of home. And whether that is making new friends uh, maybe who aren't indigenous, but who they themselves have similar uh, struggles and challenges. We can always find a we can always find a comfort with each other, and that's what I'm really finding now these days. For me, um, it's really easy to point fingers and to and to and to go back to 
what has happened or what's happening now and how it's so relevant today. But then I always have to find myself for my own healing and for me to be kind and generous to others because that's a that's one of our sacred uh, seven values is generosity and humility and like what that looks like in this context and how I don't want to pass down maybe these uh, toxic terms and I don't want to put that out there to people because we all have to live here and it's it's going to take everybody and not just indigenous people to to make this world a better place to make the environment um, healthy again and to make our earth happy. So that's the way I think of it. So being that we're migratory people, it helps me to always accept our relatives from the south, if, you know, from other countries, with like open arms. And because the Anishinaabe people, along with other nations here, and like what's currently known as the United States, had like I don't want to say borders, but territories. And we had like it wasn't based on like ownership of the land; it was based on our relationship to the land. And um, it was, it was, we had kinship with our relatives that were around us, and like there were wars and there were battles, but we also made, we, we put in an effort and we worked to create relationships with our neighboring nations so that we could share land. Like Michigan is full of, like Detroit, um, it was current, it was, it was, it was known, we know it in Anishinaabe known as Guauatanong, and it, it used to have Anishinaabe people, it used to have um, Fox and Sac and Miami and, and Métis, so many different nations, and we shared a common space because we worked on our relationships with each other and we worked on kinship. And so that thinking about that now, it's if we we have to dream of a of a, of a better future. We have to, as as writers, as creators, as filmmakers, and musicians, we have a privilege of, of being able to think and be able to dream in ways that maybe other people because of colonization and capitalism are forced to like kind of let go of because it's not, it's, it, it's, it just doesn't make money, it's, it's just dreaming, it's just thoughts. And if we can dream of a better, of a better place without these colonial borders and without, like, that's where it starts. And so if we can work towards that and even just dream and create, you know, beautiful pieces of art that make put a thought into somebody's mind or like allow somebody to think in a new way or feel a new way or feel something that they haven't felt. Like that's I think that's for me personally, like that's that's my like job as somebody who lives today. And I'm way you know, away from the snow capped mountains of Arizona way down to the desert. And, uh, <laughs> I, I play with uh, pine branches and agave play with Saladago and I, I don't know if you saw on my violin there's um uh, red on it. And it's I played a, a red light bulb on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I saw it as soon as I left my house and somehow it made sense to me because I just grabbed it and I try and because I can like you know I can feel my my uh, my home uh, way all the way across the land and uh, you know, look at the sky and all right, you know, a little, little touch, little kiss of things that really, really make sense to me, even though I'm doing it out here in in Brooklyn and in New York. I definitely feel like each one, um, like like following what what Shane just said about like creating something that makes somebody feel something they haven't felt before. I definitely felt that with all of the pieces. Um, so I just wanted to ask one last question before we open it up for the audience. And something that I've been thinking of a lot about is how um, there's like a quote that Adrian Marie Brown says that says, um, I would call the work to change the world science fictional behavior because when we are concerned, um, because we are concerned with the way that our actions and beliefs, um, they shape the, the future, tomorrow, and for next generation. So, kind of like following that um, train of thought about how like like culture work is kind of imagining like what the world could be in the future. I wanted to ask everybody like to just imagine a world where capitalism and borders and the US empire doesn't exist and you have no like financial obligations and you had a box filled with all the resources and tools that 
you can use to create anything that you dream, what do you think would be inside that box, and what would you do with it if you only had one day? <laughs> yeah. And we can start in any order. <laughs> Wait, with me or um, any order you want? <laughs> Why? Well, I would just like I I I could use a boyfriend right now. Actually, seeing those words and putting it, like, imagining this place without the United States Empire and, like, without capitalism, <coughs> just uh, back in indigenous hands and rebuilding, like, I don't know, it's just, like, that's, that's, that's it, like, that's the life. Mm -hmm. I would just, add, like, in that box, so Anishinaabe people, along with many other nations, use <coughs> tobacco as their praying. Um, I would just want tobacco in there because it's, you know, I would just need that for all the fucking hard work <laughs> that would follow. Like, it would be so much work, and, and, but it would be really, really good work. So, yeah, I don't know, I just could exist. I would finally just be able to exist. <laughs> 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 I'd, I hope my box be filled with seeds of water. That's it. Seeds and water, because you know, with seeds, you know, uh, you know, somebody's gotta, somebody's gotta know how to plant. You know, we need to, we need to, we need to start sharing that knowledge of of agriculture again. I feel like, um, I know Diné people were big agriculture people, and. You know, and we had sacred, sacred foods. You know, squash, corn, <coughs> tobacco, beans, and so just seeds and water. I think, because I feel like you know, art would art always exists. It's existed for so long, so we will always have expression. We will always have. I kind of have like music. You know, we will always have pigments coming from plants, and we'll always, and I mean, like, films are cool and all, <laughs> like, it's what I do, but like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, if you live in a world without capitalism, <laughs> like, 
you know, is that something I'd really be doing? Mm -hmm. Who knows? <coughs> Who knows? I mean, even like now, there's many community centers that are that I like to say are practicing anti-capitalist thoughts, mm -hmm. and like that they like they lend out camera equipment to communities and like for free and equipment just so that like they can get new and original content. And there's this kind of like a nationwide program, so I feel like it's just like I would still like to make movies post post collapse. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, um, you know, it's just another form of, of storytelling, just with a new medium that wasn't here before. Um, I, I don't think I would do I don't think I would make movies. I don't think I would either. I, I mean, I'm a, like, <laughs> I have my stones loud. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, in theory, in like a post, like, apocalyptic, crazy, this whole world is kind of destroyed, and like, oh, and like, I'm go. I'm thinking like way out there. <laughs> <laughs> My mind is like just went far off to different place with that question. I didn't even look at the question, so my mind is like <laughs> might have hit Shane's place where he got emotional. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> my mind, I kind of blew my own mind just now. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> Wait, did you want to say anything? Okay. Um, did you want to add anything more? <laughs> Oh, six foot. Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah. Unfortunately, we don't have any more time for questions from the audience, and then you can just talk to us and hang out and and give everybody hugs. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs>